morning, I believe it's morning for me here in LA. Um, I am, uh, my name is Tara Bixley, and I have spent two decades as a visual journalist working in newsrooms across the country. I've been a newspaper staff photographer. Uh, I was a photo editor for, <clears throat> excuse me, for Newsweek magazine and for CNN. And I also got a PhD in communication with a focus on visual journalism. And I now teach visual journalism and critical and ethical issues in journalism at Loyola Marymount University. I continue to work as an independent uh, photojournalist and I work for clients such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, HuffPost, and many, many others. Thank you for having me today. And Brent, why don't you go ahead? All right. Um, so hi. Thanks everyone for coming to hang out with us. This it's it's like noon Eastern. So to all my Eastern time zone folks, afternoon. Um, so my name is Brent Lewis. I am currently a photo editor at the New York Times um, and the co-founder of Diversify Photo. Um, I have basically kind of ran the gamut when it comes to um, being a freelance photographer and the just after graduate college, worked at some smaller papers that you never heard of. If anyone knows where Chillicothe, Ohio is, I will give you a dollar. I think there's only 219 of you all, so I feel like $2 would go out. Um, all the way up to the different posts in Denver, Colorado, as I said, photo journalist as well, and then left there and went into photo editing with ESPN's The Undefeated, um, a stint at the Washington Post, and now with uh, the New York Times. Um, so I've kind of ran the gamut overall, just kind of seeing this from all angles and different per perspectives and viewpoints. And um, even with Diversify Photo Now, which is um, a website dedicated to showing the talents of photographers of color from across the globe now. We're 600 photographers deep on the website right now, and it's kind of hoping to push and address the issues of the lack there of diversity in the visual coverage that we've been seeing throughout the history of editorial work and beyond. Right on, and Carlos, who are you? Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Carlos Gonzalez. I am a staff photographer at the San Francisco Chronicle, and I've been there for almost 25 years. I've been covering the Bay Area for almost 30 uh, since I grew up here and went to school out here. Um, in that time, I've covered stories all over the world from um, natural disasters in foreign countries to feature projects in other countries, uh, war coverage, um, you name it. I've done international work and national work for that entire time. Uh, a lot of um, protest coverage, a lot of um, working with uh, marginalized communities, whether it's immigra immigration stories or um, uh, stories that um, you know take place after natural disasters where there's a lot of vulnerable populations. Um, in terms of, um, you know, my, I, I want to add that my work with um, uh, NAHJ, NABJ, and uh, several other groups that um, help to kind of improve the uh, diversity within newsrooms. Uh, I've been with NAHJ for 12 years now, and uh, several other um, organizations um, teaching with their student projects. And that work has gone on through uh, groups like CIIJ, the Center for Integration and Improvement of Journalism at San Francisco State when it was still around to help to place um, uh, people of color and, um, and uh, in newsrooms and in, in the industry. So uh, I've worked as a picture editor as well at the Chronicle, but mostly as a staff photographer. Awesome. Um, all right, so uh, happily we have more people who've joined us. So. Um, I'd like to start us off just with a quick little um, introduction that I put together. Um, so there we go. I got to share my screen. Okay. Society has long seen photography as a trustworthy scientific form of proof, an unvarnished presentation of reality something that reflects things as they are. However, like many aspects of American society, the inherent trust in photography was swiftly used to promote and uphold white supremacy. In the late 1800s, the Zeely daguerreotypes, a series of photographs of enslaved people, 
were used by one of America's most prominent scientists of the time to present scientific proof of the racial inferiority of black people. Around the same time, a man named Frederick Douglass recognized the power of photography to empower through its ability to capture exactly what was presented in front of the lens. Douglas became the most photographed American of the 19th century as he set out to counter racist caricatures and stereotypes being portrayed in demeaning cartoons and photographs. Throughout American history, Black Americans have used the power of photos to challenge and dismantle stereotypes. We not only look at the example of Douglas, but also breathtaking images from the civil rights movement that showed unflinching images of the extreme brutality peaceful protesters faced as they held marches, sit-ins, and other forms of civil disobedience. Photos captured the dignity of civil rights leaders and the violence their bodies endured. In 1955, Emmett Till's mother insisted that photographers be allowed into his open casket funeral to capture the brutality of what had been done to his small body. Black Americans have told their own stories through photography, capturing moments of daily life, portraits of dignity and beauty and quiet moments of resistance. James Van Der Zee, Ernest Withers, Carrie Mae Weems, Gordon Parks, and John H. White, to name a few. Black revolutionaries, artists, and photographers wielded cameras to tell their own stories. But Black, Indigenous, and other people of, co people of color have never had broad ownership or control over their collective image in our society. Images of lynchings were used for decades as a form of visual violence and proof of dominance. The images of lynch bodies were so popular in certain places in America, some made postcards out of them. Race has always permeated every aspect of photography down to the very invention itself. Film was originally developed to use white skin tones as the neutral color off of which all other tones were based. Decades later, the film emulsion technology developed for digital cameras was based off of the same flawed film. I would like to open this discussion around the ethics of photographing vulnerable populations in public spaces during a time of national protest over racial inequity with all of this in mind, and an explicit acknowledgement of the inherent racism baked into our industry as much as it, as it has been the rest of American society. And with that, um, let's start this discussion. Um, I would like to start off, um, we'll start with Carlos on this one. Um, so when you go into a protest uh, that you know is going to be a vulnerable population there, like a Black Lives Matter protest, um, you know that people there might have safety issues. How do you go about uh, protecting them or doing your best to minimize harm? You know, honestly, it's just an approach I take with um, any um, vulnerable population is to connect with them and to um, use skills that I've learned throughout my career that I think most uh, journalists are using in the field anyway. Um, you communicate with them, you talk with them. And sometimes it's not about picking up your camera right away. It's about uh, engaging with, with them um, and getting a feel for this, you know, their uh, consideration of you, you know, or how how they how they would consider being, um, you know, represented. Um, it's something that just you know you work on for years and years and years. There's an intuition that comes from, you know, body language, from you know a head nod, um, talking with them um, without you know, kind of forcing the issue. And with that in mind, you still have to consider that there are situations where you can't do this because it's just these situations can be volatile and you have to, you have to work with what you've got in the moment. Um, you know, other than that, it's, um, it's really just paying attention to, to who, who is around you, basically. Um, all right. Uh, let's, we've heard a lot of discussion about different techniques, um, how to minimize harm. We've heard people talk about blurring faces, for example. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, feelings around that. Um, so 
Brent, would you like to talk a little bit about um, that discussion, the differences um, when it comes to the approaches of minimizing harm when photographers are documenting these uh, populations? Yeah, so um, the blurring faces thing, which came out, I feel like came out of left field. Um, when this, when the process began happening, really, I feel like was a lot of people who didn't fully understand journalism, how to go about it, or even the historical preferences of this moment in time, where it's like, all right, cool, we want to, I want to do something, I want to do something to help, I want to do something to protect people. Um, and it's like, blur faces. Yes, that's the easiest thing. And I think what happened in that moment, people really missed how to honestly go about this. And like, basically kind of what Carlos just spoke about was just, having those conversations, talking to people, getting information, getting some moments of like kind of acknowledgement that you're there and you're, they're also there. Like photographers need to understand this. Like you're sitting there with, you know, this giant 7,200 on top of a body. Like you're not invisible. People know that you are there. So it's like, give that moment of acknowledgement. There are people and they're out there lifting their voice. And maybe some folks don't want to be photographed. So I feel like the whole blurring face conversation kind of honestly took the power out of the people's hands and just kind of put it into the photographer's rights. Like, whoa, I, I know it's best. So I'm going to blur faces because I believe this is the way I want to help. Um, and I, I think that was completely the way, wrong way to go about it. If anything, it was, I know in certain moments that you cannot um, get names or get consent or be able to talk with the people that you're photographing. But you can watch out for these moments that might be a little more risky, that puts one at risk. Um, if there was, there's like photos of people burning cop cars and saying those burning cop cars, that's a little, that's a little iffy. You gotta ask yourself like, is that picture going to make it, is that picture going to help push the narrative that much further? Or is it going to possibly put someone in undue, in a spot of risk, in a spot of having replications, repercussions for this action that they're taking in this moment where maybe they are frustrated. Like there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of tension, there was a lot of not hostility, just this frustration boiling over in many of these protests. And so we have a moment to like minimize that risk and also understand like maybe that photo does need to be created, but maybe there's another way of creating that photo that minimizes the risk to the protests, but also still lets the public understand and see that. Um, for me, when it comes to blurring, like I spoke about before, it was just like to take that away from people, to take that humanity in a moment that we need the most. That I feel like a lot of people are honestly looking to understand what Black Americans are going through in this moment right now, and that frustration, and to pull that humanity out of those people um, kind of burns down the entire point of people out being out there in the first place. Like, Folks are out in the middle of a pandemic. This is a pandemic. People, 100,000 plus people have died. And people are putting themselves at risk to let their voices be heard because folks are fed up. And to just disregard that, like, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to save you from the police. It's like, yo, I understand that. Thank you. But we have something large that we want to say in state. And at the end of the day, taking that away from people honestly pulls away from what folks are trying to achieve. I just want to add to that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, you hit the nail on the head, Bren and Carlos, that blurring faces, it's just actually unjournalistic, I would say. It's, it goes against um, the work that we're trying to do in documenting this moment in history, this movement rather. And it also gets into the really iffy area of photo manipulation. And as photojournalists, that's something that we need to always avoid because in order to maintain public trust, we have to show that we are accurately depicting events and moments and not ever manipulating our imagery after the fact in ways that change the reality of the scene. So blurring faces is problematic in that regard. And it's also, as you pointed out, Brian, it's problematic in that we can't really see who is showing up for this movement. When you're blurring faces, everyone becomes this mass and you're not seeing the diversity of the crowd. I've photographed many protests in the last month in Los Angeles. And one of the things that's so incredibly interesting and impressive to me is how diverse that crowd is. People of all ages, races, genders. 
and a lot of um, queer communities, so many different communities coming out to show support. And that is part of the story. If we can't depict that as photojournalists, then we're missing a very important aspect of this story that we need to tell the public. Um, and I, I really think that the whole blurring faces issue has become conflated with minimizing harm. And when we're minimizing harm, we're just, we're actually doing our journalistic duty. We're talking to people, we're getting their stories, we're getting their names, where are they from? Why are they out here? If you're just photographing across, you know, across a protest and you're just walking around with your telephoto and not bothering to engage with anyone, you're really missing an opportunity to, to get a much more comprehensive story. And frankly, I've been working as a journalist for a long time. I went to J school, I teach journalism getting captioned information is a part of my job as a photographer. So how can I do that if I'm not even talking to people? And if I am talking to people, then I have the opportunity to say, hey, I'm photographing you. I just got some photos of you. Um, they'll likely end up in this publication or, you know, whatever. Maybe you're just a photographer who's going to put it on your Instagram. Whatever is happening, that engagement with the people you're photographing allows this moment of shared humanity, shared understanding, and a much more informed story, which is what we should always want as journalists. Thank you. Um, I've actually wanted to go to you for this question as well. Um, so isn't it kind of straying into activism if you're going into these demonstrations and you're taking special consideration for the safety of the demonstrators? That's a good question. I don't think that it's special consideration. We, you know, I, I live by and follow the uh, NPPA code of ethics as a photojournalist in America. And this idea of minimizing harm and paying attention to and understanding the vulnerable populations you might be photographing, that is an ethic that we are taught from early on, or at least certainly I was taught, and that I have tried to engage throughout my career. Whether you're photographing in your own neighborhood or you're going to, to Syria, to Nigeria, to Jamaica, Mexico, any of the places that we photograph, people who don't have the same power we do as Western journalists coming into that neighborhood, that community, that, you know, as Carlos, you mentioned that you photographed around the world, in natural disasters or, or you know or after natural disasters perhaps when we are engaging with people who are some of them are living the worst day or worst experience of their lives and while we want to come in and photograph that so that we can you know educate and inform people all over the world what is happening we also th those people we're photographing that is also our public we also owe them our consideration and our respect. How can we say that we're in service to this larger public, but somehow the people we're photographing are removed from that? No, if, if there's some terrible human rights or civil rights abuse or a natural disaster, some tragedy that we're trying to document, then the people we're documenting are just as important and immediately affected by the way we approach them, the way that we engage them, the way we think about them. And so I think that there's nothing activist about thinking about how we can be better people to the, to the individuals that we're photographing. There's nothing activist about considering the power hierarchies inherent to your position as a photographer who can make these images and publish them and the person that you're photographing who doesn't have a say in what photos you take, how you take them, who who they go to, where they get published, or what happens to them after they're published. So there really just is this power hierarchy there. And if we pretend that that has nothing to do with us as visual journalists, if we say that my intent is to show the world this, you know, this thing that's happening and the impact of it on the people I'm photographing has nothing to do with me, that because my intent was good, that's actually just, that's being a terrible human, I think, and being a bad journalist in many ways, because you're not really, you're not critically engaging with what's happening in front of you. You're not critically engaging with the story, with the people who are part of the story. And if you aren't doing that work, how can you actually be telling a holistic and accurate story? Um, Car go ahead, Carlos. Go ahead, Carlos. I think, I think one, of the, one of the misconceptions about this whole um, issue of, you know, um, 
consent. I think consent is a word that kind of uh, implies permission and permission implies kind of a special, a special platform. And I think that, that there's um, some ridiculous arguments about, um, you know, well, would you give a white supremacist, um, you know, that kind of same permission to, and, you know, you're looking at, 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 at such a difference in a power structure in terms of who can and can't be affected, um, you know, that um, the whole notion of um, it being an activist to engage with people and kind of understand uh, why they're there and what they're doing is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's poorly classified, I think. And, you know, rather than, than consent, I think better words to use are something like transparency and, um, you know, being able to openly discuss what you're, what you're, what you're trying to do with the story you're doing. Um, that gives people a better understanding of, um, of why you're there and the kinds of the kinds of things you're trying to accomplish with your photography. I think most journalists, you know, at least in my 30 years of, uh, of experience with working with people kind of tend to stand on the right moral path of, you know, social change, um, whether it's, you know, whether it's a, um, you know, a long process or a short process. I think we're here because we want to see good things happen to our society and the positive aspects of it. And I don't think that that can be necessarily encapsulated into kind of like this umbrella activist charge. Um, you know, that being said, we have to, you know, also, you know, be not neutral because there is no such thing as neutral anymore, but just fair. And I think that being fair to people is means talking to them and giving them the platform to um, express what, what they're doing properly. I don't know if that helps, but hopefully. Yeah, and actually, I was going to come to you for this next question as well. Um, so, you know, as photojournalists, it's our job to capture what is happening, especially if it's a breaking news event or just a news event that turns into a breaking news event because maybe, uh, you know, people start uh, breaking windows, people start lighting things on fire, people light a cop car on fire, uh, people start looting. Um, you know, in terms of what you're photographing at, at something that you're covering, we as photojournalists, we wanna photograph everything because we're not there to censor um, one, one side or another. We're not there just to photograph um, a, a police force and how they're, they're treating a group of people. We're not just there to photograph um, unrest. Um, so can you talk about if you're there when things start to uh, wh whatever group of people, and it may not necessarily be protesters, or it might be, um, start breaking things. They start lighting things on fire. They start looting. Um, what do you do about that? How do you consider um, the broader narrative, broader stereotypes within uh, American society when it comes to Black America, um, and you know the safety? or of the people involved who, you know, some of them are committing crimes? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a really great question. And throughout the years here, you know, seeing so many protests in Oakland and the Bay Area, we've kind of learned to differentiate between those who are out there for the protests, those are out, who are out there to, you know, smash and grab, and those who are out there to literally just um, create chaos. And, you know, we've had discussions at the paper for years about how we even, you know, described in captions, uh, protesters, there's looters, there's, you know, people who are in black block. We have to be very distinct about who's doing what, because we don't want the actions of a few to really place a burden on, say, a group that's there to peacefully protest. We've seen that, we've seen this literally evolve over the past 10 or 15 years. Um, but at times, you, there are things we have to cover, because there are now, I mean, honestly, groups that are taking advantage of the protests by doing this huge smash and grabs just miles away. They know that the police are going to be completely occupied with, with this large group of people. I mean, we just had a Boogaloo boy shoot a, um, a, a, federal, a federal guard, you know, not too far from a protest. Can you explain briefly uh, what a Boogaloo boy is? Sure. So the Boogaloo movement is a group of, uh, from what I'm, from what I've read, uh, a group of uh, men who want to use the unrest and the tension between police and protesters to kind of inflame a kind of a, a new civil war or some kind of like military action. And um, 
while a protest was taking place in Oakland, not too far away, I think near the downtown plaza, a federal services employee, a security guard, was shot and killed by a man who was later uh, picked up for shooting another the Santa Cruz County deputy. Um, basically, they killed him in the guard shack that they were that they were sitting in, and so they are trying to conflate these these killings with the actions of of the protesters, the Black Lives Matter movement, or whatever. And so, you're also seeing groups that are um, unrelated to the movement whatsoever, you know, doing smash and grabs on an epic scale. I mean, we had. Um, a group of guys show up at a car dealership about 15 miles away and steal 75 cars. They showed up with tow trucks, you know, because they know the police are going to be completely, you know, uh, uh, withdrawn from that area to cover the protest. Um, you know, that's that's organized. Um, that's organized crime. We have to we have to cover those stories because it's happening not just there, but you know, we had another incident where they sh where they showed up with a forklift and lifted the entire steel door of a uh, of a Best Buy and and so you know we have to be responsible to our communities to tell these stories but we also have to be responsible in how we uh, indicate what they are and who's doing what and and I think you know to to put it all together as part of the Black Lives Matter movement is irresponsible and really not not what what good journalism is. I want to add onto that with your question Leah um I don't think it's a matter of what you choose not to photograph. I think it really is in the moment of photographing things, making these critical choices and not being a lazy journalist. You know, like Carlos, what you're speaking to, I witnessed those same things miles away or about three quarters of a mile away from one of the first protests I went to. I saw a man run around a corner, smash a bunch of windows and run back to the suburbs. He had nothing to do, or to this neighborhood rather. He had nothing to do with those protests. And if I photographed that and submitted that in the same space as all of these other images where people were completely peacefully protesting, handing out masks and sanitizer, hand sanitizer, and, and really engaging in, in a totally peaceful protest, then I would be misconstruing what happened and I would be doing a bad job as a journalist. Um, and in situations where you're trying to think quickly about how your images might affect the people you're photographing. Another example, I came upon this scene at, close to a protest where a burnt, there was a burned out car. And there are people jumping on the car, walking on it, holding up flags, posing for photos clearly. And then there was a protester who was lighting an American flag on fire. Now, I didn't, choose, I didn't say, well, I'm not going to photograph that. Instead, I positioned myself so that you couldn't really see their face. And I was thinking all the time about, okay, how can I actually show what's happening here in an interesting way and tell this story without clearly making it possible to identify this person who is doing something illegal? I think that that is just, that is me working towards minimizing harm and trying to tell the story and not just saying, oh, well, this might harm them and so I won't do it. You know, there is a way to balance those two things. And we make so many choices as photographers. We're constantly deciding what we'll leave in the frame, what we'll take out. We're composing as we go. We're thinking about light and so many different things. It's not really that hard to add in this consideration of, well, how do, do I do this in silhouette? You know, if someone, this car is blazing and this person is standing on top of it, that's a choice that you could make. That'll still be a compelling image. It will still tell the story, but it might make it much more difficult for that image to later be used by police to identify that person and arrest them. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think you, you are, uh, several of you are touching on this um, idea of objectivity, which um has always been kind of like a, a golden, or not always, but in the last few decades, um, a word that's used in journalism as kind of this golden standard to obtain. Um, and more recently, we've been talking about objectivity and, you know, that it's more, that that idea itself is based on what I was talking about in the beginning um, similarly, you know, film is created as the neutral color is from white skin. So um, the idea of objectivity as we know it today within journalism has kind of been based off of, um, you know, people, the gatekeepers, people in power, uh, mostly white, uh, you know, male, um, 
you know, editors or, or you know, anybody who's been in the, in the media industry. Um, so I think that's, that's something to um, keep in mind when we're talking about um, when you're approaching a scene and you say, um, I'm just objective, I'm just here to capture whatever. I think that's exactly what you were talking about, Tara, that um, we, we can't just walk into a scene and not think critically about what we're doing there. Um, I just had one little comment that I thought was a really interesting thing that happened um, the other night. I, I, I know I'm, I'm a moderator, but I photographed a man who was burning an American flag hat. He had a mask on. Um, he wanted his photo to be taken. I spoke to him afterwards and he wanted his name with the photo. Not only his face, but he wanted his name. And we, we, went, we went over several different ways of the fact that Reuters is an international service, that that photo would be going everywhere. It could end up anywhere. Um, and I think at some point, the, the level, you have to respect the people that you're photographing and you have to believe them when they tell you what they do and do not want. Um, that was just a side note. So I do some, we're, we're getting a lot of questions and discussions. So I wanna get into some of that. Um, I, I just briefly, um, this is kind of a big question, but uh, Wayne Thomas says, who is vulnerable? Can we define this? Is the person breaking the window in a protest vulnerable or is the shop owner whose window was just broken vulnerable? Um, Brent, do you wanna start off with answering this or discussing it? Yeah, so I, I think it's the idea of who's vulnerable. I think honestly we have to look at it from an overarching glance of just how this country works, who are the vulnerable people in this country overall. I think in a moment between like a shop owner and a protester, honestly, you got to ask yourself, is that a protester who's breaking a window? Like, let's just start there first. Uh, I think that's the bigger question. But I think when it comes to the idea of who's vulnerable overall, it goes to like the levels of power that America itself is created off of. Um, so for me, it's, it's tough to speak on that one. Cause that's why I was like, oh, I was hoping you wouldn't come to me directly for that one first. But in that moment, for me, it's where that picture is created, that picture is made, but you capture that scene. I don't, I don't think that, I think there is a masking of not directly possibly showing the process who they're doing the damage, but I think it's more or less looking at the shop owner because that's the person who made their store on top of that in the first place that that's the person i really want to understand that's the person that i feel for at the end of the day because who knows about their livelihood who knows about what's happening next with them they have to fix themselves and repair from that moment and come back from that and I, we don't know how their business is going to be affected so they are vulnerable in that situation but also let's look at you know the protests who might be driven to this way because we don't know what they're going through we don't know the frustrations that they're having we don't know their background um, so I think in that moment, like, let's just take this on fair ground and just understand where everyone involved in this moment is coming from. Um, and, you know, I don't think most likely the protest is breaking the window. They're not going to sit down and have a conversation with you, really, but you never know. You never heard the kind of acts. But um, at the end of the day, it's just really taken in this moment. And I think when we come to vulnerable overall, it's just really looking at the power structures that are created in America and coming back and having a conversation off of that, thinking off of everything from that angle and that light. Right. So thinking about, um, you know, the uh, good example, the FBI released wanted posters of people who had thrown chains and uh, ropes and stuff over um, the Jackson Memorial um, because they, the, the thought was that they wanted to tear it down. They never did. Um, but now there's been raids on several homes um, and there's been people, you know, uh, the FBI is looking for people who, um, you know, if you look at, at, at the situation, um, nothing was actually torn down. Um, so it, it, it's, we're talking about power structures um, at the end of the day, we're not gonna argue about whether or not they should have been doing that. Um, it's really just about keeping, uh, you know, context, historic context in mind. We're talking about, right now we're talking about America. We're talking about um, what we're photographing and what we're seeing and what we're covering um, in the context of American history and, yeah. our, and our systemic 
uh, racism in this country. So um, this is a question for photo editors um, from Kate. When are, uh, sorry, when there are riots and violence, what is your thought process in choosing those photos? Is it more important to show what happened accurately or try and prevent glorification of rioting? Tara, would you like to take that one on? Um, sure, I think this is probably a better question for Brent since he's currently working as a photo editor. But or I Brent. Think, <laughs> I'll just say one thing quickly that I think before kicking it to Brent. Um, had, I was working actually as a photo editor during the Ferguson protests and uh, there was this moment that I've actually written about for Neiman Reports. So I apologize if someone's heard this anecdote before, but there was a moment where we were trying to choose a photo that would run double truck in the opening of the magazine and to depict what was happening in Ferguson. And one of the other photo editors, we were all asked to bring different images from the wires and from photographers who we hired to work down there. And one of the other photo editors suggested an image of a large black man the photograph is taken from below and he's looking directly into the camera. He has a gun in his, uh, tucked into his waistband and he's in the act of robbing uh, that gas station, the infamous gas station that would later be set on fire. And they were, the other editors and many on the editorial team were so excited about using that particular image because they said, oh, it's so, you know, the intensity of his gaze. And I, I thought this is ridiculous there's a huge protest happening about the killing of this 18 year old man and this looting or violent, whatever this is that's happening in this moment, that might be an aspect of what's going on, but that's not the entirety, that's not the story. That's just inaccurate storytelling. If the story was about a robbery of a gas station, sure, amazing image, but right now we're actually just playing into a very stereotypical depiction of black men and completely ignoring the truth of this extensive protest movement. There's hundreds and if not thousands of people gathered outside of that gas station and what they're doing I think is more accurate to the story to be photographed than what this person is doing. Luckily they agreed when I when I kind of brought that up and and I think that's the work that photo editors have to be doing. You just need to be thinking critically. Am I falling prey to, wow, there's fire in that. And, or there was a gun or look how mad they look. Instead of saying, what is the story here? How do I tell this story in a, in a way that is really going to explain to the readers and the viewers what's happening? That's what we have to be doing. Brent. <laughs> yeah. And just continue off of that, that amazing, uh, trail that you let us down, that at the end of the day, honestly, it's looking at what is the overarching story? What is actually happening here? I get it. Like one moment that this might just be like, oh, this photo is amazing. It says so much, but is it really accurately saying what's happening? What is going on on the ground? So yeah, I think you need to, you need to have those pieces in there so that people, A, look back, I don't know if people actually read the paper, physical paper anymore, but like next morning you're like flipping through the pages and you can understand like, oh, okay, that happened, that happened, that happened. That's great to have in there. But at the end of the day, it comes on what you're placing that onus on. What are you giving that power? What are you giving that A1 spot to? What are you giving that homepage play? Um, I think that moves away. Are those images, do those images need to be somewhere in there? Yeah, I think there's a few that need to be in there. I think they have that power. You need to be able to reflect in those moments for future generations to be able to look back like, this happened here, this is how this went down. There are some people who were breaking things and maybe doing a little bit of rioting, but there are also a lot more people protesting. I think that has been left out of history in so many ways uh, when it comes to seeing the photos from previous movements, previous uprisings. Like we get to the burning stuff, but we don't see the, how it began. We don't see how that frustration boiled over. So I think there is a moment where you just have to understand you need to have all these pieces of this puzzle together to make an accurate story of what happened. Um, I was trying to like, even like a hip hop um, metaphor here. One of my favorite things is just kind of like, look at like Charles Gambino's like, this is America. Um, we're gonna go here for a moment. I'm sorry. We're gonna take this hip hop journey, but um, like that is where, in the forefront of the of it, you kind of get these these happy go lucky dancing moments. 
Um, but once you actually look behind the back of the video, you can see how like everything that's kind of happening going on. All that's one part of it. And for that video alone, just like telling the stories in general, like you have to see the whole picture of everything to fully understand what's happening. And although there might be this happy thing going on in the middle, there's also some craziness happening and vice versa. So throwing the photos of the rise are like the crazy thing. That's just the one thing to know, but there might be all this other peaceful stuff on the side that you're not seeing. So just zeroing in on this one thing is not telling the full amount of the story and not bringing honestly everything that you need to see. So thought process that goes into choosing those photos is just making sure that you're doing it accurately, making sure that you're talking with the photographers that are out there doing the work. If you can, if they're on, they're on, they're on assignment with you, talking with them, speaking with them, getting an understanding of what's happening. Um, and then just honestly making your best judgment call to balance everything out at the end of the day. That's, that's the way it should be done and hopefully everyone is doing it. Can I add something, Leah? Yeah, real quick, yep. This isn't really just a, um, a question for the photo editors either. I mean, I've worked as a photo editor for years, um, you know, during Occupy, during uh, a lot of the um, Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, protests. And as a photographer, you actually have a lot more say um, in terms of defining how the coverage goes than you think. It's, you know, you, you are out on the field, you are eyes on the street. Um, and I've actually called in and, and reminded picture editors on the desk, hey, this, this, this whole event has largely been very peaceful. Um, there was some spot violence, there was some shouting, there was some shoving, but that didn't define the whole day. And I and other photographers have had that discussion about why are they <laughs> using, you know, the big fight scene, you know, eight columns on a double truck when, when overall the story should be about, you know, this, this, uh, this, you know, largely peaceful protest. So you, you, you can push back a little bit. You can have, you know, input, you know, on how the coverage goes because you, you know, you're doing, you're the first set of editing in the field you are choosing the kinds of pictures that you send, the kinds of things that you cover, and you do the kind of work that a journalist has to do, and you ask the questions, you get the right information, and then you put that in your captions. You don't just show up and, and go with a generic cut line, you know, protesters smash a window, blah, 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 because that's, that's lazy. That's not really, you know, covering these events, you know, properly at all. Um, so I just, uh, I'd like to point out that what we're discussing right now is really talking about the power that photographers and photo editors and um, members of the press have um, with, you know, capturing images to tell a story. So I just want to reinforce that the power dynamic is something that is at the base of a lot of these discussions. Um, so a question that I'm seeing um, repeatedly, I'll just use Tim's here. As trust in journalism declines and tensions rise, it feels like that's increasingly, that it's increasingly hard to build and maintain trust with the vulnerable population and general public. My question is, how do you engage with them to gain their trust and tell their stories? What, what steps would you recommend? That's a pretty big one. Um, I know you just finished speaking, but do you want to start, Carlos? Yeah, and this is something I, I preach regularly. Um, you have to start months, years, whatever, before the protests start going. I mean, we're talking about communities that are available to you, you know, 95% of the time of the year outside of the protest. And what we do on a daily basis, how we cover these situations when things aren't being, you know, when there's no posters or banners or graffiti or chalk art or whatever, that's what lays the foundation for better work in those communities from the very beginning. I, you know, I started my career at very small newspapers and they, they taught me the responsibility we have to the public who, who read our paper, who see themselves in this coverage. And you know, get out there into these communities, engage with, with people in, in all the different neighborhoods in your city. We, in San Francisco, it's like these little tiny fiefdoms, you know, all over the city, but we don't tend to cover a lot of them because we're so, you know, um, we're short staffed, first of all, but we have to make the effort to get out and, you know, into different areas of, you know, like the, the Delta out here is very much like, you know, some parts of the Midwest. And, you know, those stories need to be told um, you know, start engaging on, on these small, on these smaller stories that really are meaningful, that really kind of like, you know, bring, bring better representation of, of what you do to these communities and vice versa. You bring 
those communities to your entire readership. And that really helps to build a better relationship. I want to add to that, Leah. Yeah. Um, you know, I photographed in a lot of different situations um, from press conferences by a mayor in Greenville, South Carolina to migrant caravan at, in Tijuana held at the border. And now in these protests, and in all of the all of the spaces I've been in across my career, I have seen some really reprehensible behavior by news photographers. As, and I say specifically news photographers because I honestly haven't seen this behavior as consistently with journalists just writ large. But the level of um, entitlement that often comes across in the way that photographers approach individuals or an event, it's really palpable, it's really apparent. And I don't think that people intend to do that. I don't think that they're thinking about it or recognizing it at all. But the public is actually very intelligent and very capable of recognizing when they're being um, demeaned or when people are walking around with this sense of entitlement. And I've seen in the protests, I saw news photographers, no masks, smoking in the middle of a crowd. <laughs> um, I, I was personally pushed by several different photographers because I, I guess they, they think that they have the right to jump in front of my photo. Um, and seeing that happen over and over again, seeing photographers just run and crowd uh, young women and children and then walk away, never speaking to the parents to confirm that. Then actually I brought my daughter to a protest and watched the photographer he pushed me out of the way, stepped in front of me, took a bunch of photos of my daughter and walked away. Never even looked to see where this child's mother might be um, to get any kind, to have any kind of conversation. And I'd said earlier that this is, you know, this is just bad journalism. It's just lazy journalism. We should be talking to people. We should want to get captioned information. We should want to know the story. But that kind of action, when people are experiencing that over and over again, that's losing public trust. People aren't going to want to talk to us. They're going to have this whole idea of the news media, of being bad actors, of extractive practices, which means that you're just taking from a situation, you know, documenting it, taking, not, not trying to engage or understand, and then leaving and just using that, those images or that, that, um, that documentation for your own gain. And to, to win awards or to, you know, to get accolades and get that, 18 column, you know, double truck image that you feel so good about. If we aren't engaging in a kind and uh, trustworthy way with the people that we're photographing, they won't trust us. They, we won't get as good of a story. We will not be able to, you know, we're going to continue to go down this road of losing public trust and losing public engagement and losing readers and viewers. That I think is just, something we really need to grapple with because we like to pretend in journalism that all of this is happening outside of us, that you know the president and politicians are saying bad things about journalists, but at least a portion of that is also on us and our own behavior. How are we comporting ourselves in these spaces and can we do better? I think that we can and we should. Yeah, um, and I'm gonna oh, can I pop in really, really quickly. Yeah, I'm, go I'm for it, Brent. Go for it. Um, but no, it's, it's, and it really, for me, it's always, it becomes a combination of what Carlos and Tara both said. So these already underreported communities that like people don't go to, I'm from, born and raised in Chicago. That's also a record of 50 minutes without saying that. But, um, and when I was an intern in the Chicago Tribune, like my thing was like immediately, when I got there, I was like, I'm going to the South Side of Chicago. I'm doing stories that have nothing to do with like, brown folks being murdered or being shot like it has nothing to do with the box that was my original thing but i we haven't been seeing those communities so with the idea of like people protesting in the streets that might be their first interaction with a news photographer um and not having their report their communities at all covered like it's this automatic sense of built-in distrust like i don't know who you people are where you guys come from the only time i see you in my community is when someone has been shot, there's been a murder, there's been a robbery, there's been something like that. So I already have this level of distrust. And then to just kind of force your way and get what you need and then leave again, like, I don't have this level of respect for you. We don't have this back and forth comparison the way that, you know, if you go, I'm gonna bring everything back to Chicago again, um, to like the north side of Chicago in the predominantly white areas where like, oh yeah, you show up there for like, I don't know, Timmy's Bar Mitzvah. 
um, in moments like that. But like that doesn't happen on the other side of the tracks. It doesn't happen on the south side. It doesn't happen on the west side of Chicago. So that rapport isn't built and we're losing that trust. And what I think many news photographers, media organizations have lost are just fully understanding that we are a global audience. Yeah, you know what? Um, my man's probably does not subscribe to the New York Times, but guess what? It pops up in his Facebook feed. It pops up on his Twitter. The photos seen are seen in his Instagram. We are dealing with a global audience and we need to understand and see that. So the work has to be done. We have to go out and we have to cover stories on other sides. Like we have to cover stories on other sides of the tracks that aren't just when things go wrong. One of, my, one of the moments that like made this apparent for me was I was working on South Side Chicago one weekend um, and uh, I think I was looking for like weather features. It was a warm day. And once again, sorry, if people heard the story. Um, but I got out of my car, saw some kids like playing an open fire hydrant. And I was like, oh man, this is great. Also, I feel like it's like a checkbox. Me personally, I wanted to make, which is the kids playing in fire hydrant because it makes me feel young again. Hopped out the car, saw these kids playing, you know, waited a little while, made a few photos. One of the kids turns around and says, hey, what are you doing? Like, oh man, I'm Brent Lewis from the Chicago Tribune. Boom, immediately, that's consent. Um, just letting him know what I'm doing. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, cool, cool. You know, he walked away. And then so I moved around to this other kid. I was photographing the bag, made these really nice photos. And he turned around to me. He's like, oh, man, what's going on? Somebody get shot? And I was like, wow. Wow, that's, that's the, that, to me, that nearly went, like, that was the only time you see someone with a camera in your neighborhood when someone gets shot. That's a problem. That's an issue. Um, that is why there is this lack of mistrust. It's lack of distrust in so many of these communities that people are trying to scramble now the only time they see us or when something like this breaks out. So we have to change that. We have to tell those stories. And I know it might be uncomfortable for folks to go over to some of these neighborhoods. And I might, it might be, they might not know how to talk and get to know them, but guess what? If you just go over there and talk to folks like they're actual people, um, and get to know their stories and ask them about their lives, you're going to A, open up level of conversation and connections. So when something like this happens, again, you will have understanding and B, you will just be able to tell stories that others aren't being told, um, that other publications, outlets, photographers in general aren't telling these stories. And we have honestly a responsibility to the public, the public, which is everyone, honestly, because we live in a global world again. Um, to tell these stories, so we have to. And so this is how we build that trust. This is how you build that in um, and just introduce yourself, so. So we, we have a lot of questions um, that we're not totally gonna get to. I, I'm sorry, I know we could, uh, I, I wanna move on to, I'm sorry, Carlos. I wanna move on to a couple more so that we can try and get to as many as possible. Um, this is something we haven't discussed as much, but you did touch, it, touch on it. Um, I, I don't know if someone wants to raise their hand for this one, but um, there's been a proliferation of photos on social media, um, you know, because of the internet, uh, you know, news, news photos aren't just appearing in isolated communities and spaces. Um, so how has that changed our relationship, but also our responsibility um, and even uh, the power dynamics, if it has changed at all, um, with, uh, with the people that we're photographing. Does someone want to raise their hand for that one? Go ahead, Tara. Yeah, I'll start. Um, and I think you're right, Leah, in that we have actually been kind of speaking to that across these um, discussions about ethics in a protest environment. When we're, when we're talking about vulnerable populations, that's what we mean, people who can be who are subject to the whim of the state and a surveillance society such that they're, they're exercising their First Amendment rights by being in the streets and protesting what they see as civil rights abuses, that that might be endangered by our own images, which will be used by police and the federal government to identify these people as bad actors. That is actually a real concern in this contemporary society. A lot of the conversations I've seen around um, you know, informed consent or minimizing harm is like, well, if we didn't take this photo in 1940, then 
if we didn't get consent then, well, this that wasn't a concern then. We weren't concerned about that. It's a totally different situation. Here in this context and in other places like Hong Kong, Kashmir, where Puerto Rico, where people are, are clashing with heavily militarized state forces, and then they have the surveillance technology to comb through millions of images on the internet, that is something that we actually have to think about. And I think it's a, it's a delicate balance. We can't be responsible for every potential use of our photographs in future. It just, that's crazy making and it just really isn't possible. What we can do is educate ourselves, learn about these systems and be aware of it and then just be cognizant in the field as we're talking to people and you know getting that recognition from people. I have, I've photographed five protests at this point five or six, I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of people. And I typically do this thing where I'm just kind of, if I can't get to them to speak to them, um, you know, very close or whatever, then I might just point to my camera or wait for them to see that I'm, I'm taking photos and just get that nod. Carlos, I think you were mentioning that earlier. Of all of these hundreds of people, only two people have asked me not to photograph them. And so I'm not, you know, there's nothing, um, there's nothing impossible about this work of thinking about, okay, what, what might happen if these images are taken out of context, but doing things like there was a, a, a curfew here in LA and part of that curfew, that whole thing is to make it illegal to be in the streets. So if I'm photographing anyone who's in the streets after curfew, even if they're just sitting there, I've actually documented them in a, a moment of criminal activity. And my images, as I publish them to you know, a newspaper or Instagram or wherever, can be used to arrest that person. That's ridiculous, but it's real. And that is something that I think about as I'm photographing and I'm weighing those things because I think it's my responsibility to consider them as much as I can. Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great answer. So, um, our, our panelists have agreed to talk for an hour, but I would like to give y'all the option if people are available to extend a little bit if you want to. Um, in a couple of minutes, you're also welcome to drop out of the conversation since that was the original agreement. Um, but if anybody wants to stay a little bit longer to keep talking, um, we have plenty of questions that we could uh, we can continue to go over. Um, uh, I think before, I, I think we've kind of gone over this, um, but I, just before we go, um, I, I would like you guys to, if you could be a slightly brief about it, um, what do you, what do we owe the public um, yeah, as photojournalists and um, what do we owe those uh, to those people that we photograph whose lives that we're documenting um, and I know you just finished, but I'd like you to start, Tara. Um, well, thank you for that question, Leah, because I think it's something that we really need to be thinking about and talking about that we maybe haven't in, in the ways that we should. And something I see coming up a lot is this idea that, you know, photojournalists are, are eyewitnesses. We're photographing the first draft of history. Um, and we imagine this public as whoever is going to look at our work once it's published. And in that equation, we're not including, like I had mentioned earlier, we're not including the people that we're actually photographing. When you're working in a, um, when you're photographing refugees, asylum seekers, people who have uh, you know, just experienced this huge nat natural disaster that has ruined you know, their home and really affected their lives, they are also our public. It's not just the people who are back home waiting to be told about this thing, who are just, you know, sitting in their armchairs learning about the world. So our public is everyone. Our public is also, you know, I'm, I'm a citizen. I, I consider myself a, a public when I'm reading, a part of the public when I'm consuming media. And so if we think about this in terms of what, what is the job of a visual journalist? What is journalism? We're trying to inform everyone, that public, which is everyone. We're trying to hold power accountable. We're trying to recognize and educate everyone about civil and human rights abuses such that we can have a better society. So what do we owe the public? 
kind of everything. Like that, that's our job is to make it possible for them to vote intelligently, to, 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 you know, make choices from a position of knowledge about everything that's happening. And we, we have more access a lot of the time to these spaces of power than the average person. And it's also, it's, you know, something I tell my students is, while it would be wonderful if everyone took the opportunity to kind of educate themselves and read a lot, there are many people who are working double shifts as single parents who are, who don't have the time to, you know, dig into, read this thousand page bill that's hitting the house floor. And so it's our job to condense that and contextualize it and to make it possible for people to understand quickly what's going on that is affecting their lives so that they can make the choices they need to make as informed citizens who are voting, who are buying things, who need to know, you know, what is Jeff Bezos doing today? Do I want to buy from Amazon? That's what we're letting them know so that they can make their own choices. And if you know, as I've said, I've returned to multiple times. It's just that holistic, accurate storytelling and, and contextualizing is so important to, to serving our public. And that's what I want to see us dig into, you know, really like, um, really start thinking so much more about what does it mean to do this work as a journalist and a visual journalist in a surveilled society, in a society where there are millions of images going out every day. Like, how do we how do we stand apart from that mass of information and do some work that the public can trust, that the public can understand, that they can connect to, that they can feel helping their lives? And that's what I. Uh, I don't know if y'all th that was at the end. The connection was a little iffy, but I think we got the, the we got uh, ninety. 9.9% of that um, <laughs> very, very thorough answer. Um, we, we have gone over one. I don't know if either of y'all want, uh, Carlos or Bren, if you want to add to that. I, if anybody wants to stay, I have a few questions that I think are interesting um, and you know something that we should probably address. Um, anybody who wants to leave, um, you know, the panelists agreed to an hour, so that is absolutely 100% you're right. So. If, if Carlos, if you're interested in adding to that. Um, Brent, do you want to go Or Brent. Okay. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, no, I think we owe a lot to the public, honestly. And for me, we owe the public to get it right. I think at the end of the day, that's, that's what we owe it to the public to get it right, to get it accurate, to get it, to understand the entire whole story. Like, I think a lot of people rest upon the idea of the First Amendment. Like, oh, okay, we get the First Amendment rights. Like, we have those rights because what we do is a public service. Um, that is why that's in there. That's why it was the first step. Like, years and years and years and years and centuries ago, when it was written, like, it was a reason why that was in there. That, because people wanted that free press. People needed that free press and they understood the power of the free press. So we owe to the public to get it right, to get it accurate, to so make sure that the stories that we're telling are reflected, that they see themselves in it and it, that it makes them understand the world around them. Like Tara was saying, like people sometimes don't have the ability to dive into these documents or go to the places that we get the chance to go when that, and that is like the steps of Congress or to um, a neighborhood that's not being looked at or reflected in the media report overall, and to tell the stories about how both of these worlds understand them, understand what's going on and how they live. And that is our duty as journalists, is to go out there, tell those stories, bring them back, filter them into a com nice, compact, holistic story, and let people understand the way of the world. Like, are we going to put our spin on it? No. What we're, going, what we're doing here is just getting that information out so people can understand the world around them. They won't be able to say, oh, I didn't know that. Um, we're going to be like, no, 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 no. This is, it's right here. It is right here. This is what's going on in the world and the universe. And you see that. And we hold the people in power accountable and to make the changes that we and the public and all in a whole need. Um, so that's what I feel like we owe the public is we've been bestowed honestly this rule that we have the power to go out in the world and capture these moments and take in this information and get it back out to the public and we don't i think 
a lot of people are relying on that like as some hall pass like no 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 as or like we're deserving of this no we're not deserving of this we are doing a service for the public for ourselves everyone in general and for future future generations to come so we owe the public to get it right and to hold up our end of the bargain if they're going to give us this this rule and this law that we get to lean on we damn sure need to make sure that we're doing it correctly and feeding back Thank you. Well, Carlos, do you want to add? Yeah, just real quick. Um, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with Tara and with uh, Brent. And this is not, you know, something for our, our own glamour and our own, you know, self-worth. It's really for the public. And to, we have to treat the people in front of the lens, in front of the microphone, and, you know, and, you know, somebody you're reporting on with as much dignity and respect as possible, because we have to bring that back to the public. There are people out there who cannot be out protesting. There are people out there who are too scared to come out and either be seen in their community doing this and to let them know that there's, you know, kindred spirits or people who are actually out there fighting the fight is really super important. Um, you know, I'm going to probably say something that might <laughs> turn, turn some, some heads, but uh, I, I don't firmly believe that the First Amendment was written for us as journalists. I think it was written for the public. We operate under the protection of the First Amendment, but the First Amendment is really about uh, the public, the communities, the people out there uh, being well informed and being given the best information that they have, and also you know as a as a way for you know us as conduits for that to improve uh, improve our country and you know be responsible for giving people you know a um, you know a more informed look so hopefully hopefully that's what we're doing I want to add on to that because we haven't really touched on the first amendment. Yeah. issue which has become a touch point and i think that's an excellent uh way of stating that carlos that the first amendment was intended to protect the public it's intended to protect the citizenry so that we have the best access to information as possible so when it enshrines the rights to a free press it's not just for us to be able to do whatever we want it's so that we can do our jobs well for the public and not have fear of reprisal from the government or from other forces. So when we're taking, you know, when we're going to the streets to document this public movement where the public is using its First Amendment rights, it, we should also be thinking about how the work we're doing positively or negatively affects them. It's part of our responsibility to one another, right? Um, and I don't think that, uh, you know, there's been some chatter about, you know, this is infringing on my First Amendment right as a journalist that I would have to ever speak to or ask consent of, you know, or, or consider minimizing harm, which is really problematic on multiple levels. But I, I don't think that anyone is trying to turn minimizing harm into a, a another amendment of the Constitution. Last time I checked, I think that we're all operating from a good faith, you know, attempt to um, to both do our job as journalists and use that First Amendment freedom as a free press and you know the, the right to assemble as we see in these protests. And those First Amendment rights shouldn't be butting up against one another. They're in concert, they're in conversation. You're coming out here to protest, you're in public. I have the right to photograph you, thankfully, so that I can show everyone what is happening and you know amplify that message so that people understand that there are civil rights abuses and that they need to pay attention to it and their fellow citizens are protesting about it but just because i can do whatever i want under that first amendment doesn't mean that i should and a law is different from an ethic so the law says we can do whatever we want because we're in public and we can photograph but the ethics say we should minimize harm and so our job as critical and hopefully smart journalists who are well read and paying attention and care about the people we're photographing is to find that balance between my right ensconced in law and my ethics, which is my moral obligation to the people I'm photographing. Those two things are not counter to one another. They should be in conversation. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I'm glad we got to go over that. I if anybody's still staying on maybe for like 10 more minutes, I have a really interesting question here. Um, so this is from Scott following the right to be forgotten movement question above. I've had uh, quite a few cases where people I photographed at Trump events a few years ago and who had given me their name and consent 
then tracked me down years later to remove their names and their photos from my online archive because my our online archive dominates search results for their names. This has happened to me at least five times. What should be done in that situation? I don't want people's lives to be adversely affected by my work, regardless of their politics, but I also don't want to erase history. Anybody want to jump in on that one? It's a big one. Um, um, I have, Tara. A, if I'm understanding that question right, it sounds as though, I think if that were happening to me, I would just take their name out of, you know, remove their name from being associated with the image because if the name isn't associated the algorithm a search algorithm will pick it up is my understanding and so you're not eliminating um the historical accuracy of what you documented you're just helping to ensure that that's not the only thing that comes up under that person's name which seems like a fair balance to me yeah, and I, I think that might also fall under this entire discussion about why we talk to people um, that we're photographing, because it's not only about just getting consent, sometimes it's just about informing people of where their photo could end up and what the repercussions are. Not repercussions, but just that, you know, if they put their name with it, um, it's gonna, it can be searchable. Um, so I think that goes back to us discussing being journalists in this digital age. Um, I, I'm, I, I do just really quickly, um, Carlos touched on this, but I'm still seeing this point. Um, uh, people have talked about, should we be protecting um, if we cover a white supremacist or Nazis burning, uh, uh, or KKK people burning a cross, should we be protecting their identities? Carlos, do you want to go? God, that's a that's a tough question because I'm so you know diametrically opposed to that philosophy. But um, you know it. Uh... And Brent, I know you also talked about this in something an article that you wrote recently. Yeah, I, I don't have a, an answer right now for that. Let me let me see if these guys can can prompt. Why don't you, yeah, why don't you take that, Brent? Yeah, so for me, it's always come down to um, like it really. Oh, it's such a it's such a tough like it's it's it goes both ways in a way, um, but I think it is the ideal. Uh, it comes back to that like power dynamic in such a way, um, and more or less when it comes to that overarching ideal of protection. Um, I think it's, it's minimizing the uh, understanding by doing harm in, in, in a way, but it also is just making sure that that information is out there. I think um, one of the biggest things that came out of like Charlottesville for me, uh, when we, the amazing, the horrific AP photo of guys with tiki torches, um, is that people might not have understood that that, that movement was happening. Um, like I remember seeing articles pop up about like how we missed the rise of white supremacy. And it's like, yeah, no, nah, I don't think we really missed that. But like that photo was the overarching point for a lot of Americans, a lot of people in general. And I was like, oh, this is still a thing that's going on. So when it comes down to the idea of whether or not protecting people, I think it's still getting the accurate depiction of what's going on. I think as long as we're not losing that, I don't feel as, oof, it's, it's a good one. It's, just, yeah. it's a really, really dark one. Um, I, think, no, I'd like, I, oh, go ahead. I think, I think Tara, I think my question as a follow-up to this question is, um, are, are these groups that people keep comparing to each other, are they, are, is that a, is that a equivalent uh, comparison? No, this is a false equivalency. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. Um, the thing here, you know, first, I think we need to be, again, very careful about our language. I, I'm not advocating for protecting the identity of protesters, right? Like, that is not what I think we're saying. I think what we're saying is minimizing harm, so thinking critically, right? And 
and recognizing the power dynamics. So if you're recognizing power dynamics as you're, sh you're photographing in the field, the police and the state and white supremacists who are violently aggressing or acting against uh, people of color or anyone, because as we've seen, there are white protesters who have been killed by white supremacists. So the people who are aggressing and acting against those who have less power than them, that is the vulnerable population in this space. And white supremacists have the power. They have the white privilege. They have this, you know, they're backed by centuries of white supremacy that is ensconced in this country and in the police and in the federal government here and in many institutions, including journalism. So they're not out of power and we don't need to be concerned as journalists with how we're representing them because they don't, they're not at risk of being harmed by our images, I would say. They might be at risk of being uh, litigated because they're running someone over with their car or they're, um, you know, or they're hurting people, being violent, et cetera. So I think- or being doxxed. Being, okay. So that, that, I think that is the one thing that's kind of tricky is, what is our, when we talked about our responsibility to the public and what, what we're doing as journalists, if we're holding power accountable, then who falls into that space? If we're photographing a white supremacist who's beating a black man or running someone over with their car at a protest, aren't, isn't that the power that we're holding accountable? Aren't we responsible for documenting that and letting the public know that that's happening? So that's the thing that I'm, I'm always asking. Who is, who's the power structure? Who's the hierarchy in this situation that I'm supposed to be depicting what potential abuses of power they're taking? So if you're operating from that space, then I think that that's how you answer this question for yourself. In what, in what space does a white supremacist, um, it, where are they being disempowered? How are they, you know, why do we need to consider this as a, a concern of, that they might be a vulnerable population? That's why I think this false equivalency is, is coming out for me. And I think there's a, there's a lot of um, numbers and research out there about uh, the populations um, who hold power in this country and who have historically still held power. If people are wondering about that still, they can do that research. I wanted to kind of touch on that you know i didn't want to give, let my hesitations imply that i'm for giving them um protection because i'm you know if they're taking a position that they want to deny deny somebody else's um rights or personhood or whatever they they are not entitled to be out there and uh and then have the anonymity of um you know of you know doing this and then us remaining silent i mean we are we are here to to you know provide um provide what we do to, you know, make these kinds of evils go away. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally why we're here. Um, the, the problem is that sometimes when this is, um, these kinds of questions, th that's a hard stop for me, but th these questions can be, these, these can be nuanced and there's like different, it's like, it's like a grayscale, you know, there's like, okay, so you have the white supremacists up here, you have the Nazis up there too. And then you have like, okay, so what's next and what's next and what's next. And then we have these kind of like in the field uh, decision making that might not be as well informed sometimes. And I just wanted to share one thing. I was trying to figure out how to include this without it being too, um, you know, in the, in the previous uh, discussions, but um, there are people out there who, who don't have the full, um, how should I say, um, journalistic skill set yet. Or the experience to be able to kind of like wade through these nuances and um you know a couple of weeks ago there was a story about a photographer who was um, photographed at the tulsa rally um mike brooks i don't know if, you, if anybody saw the article about it um the photographer win mcnamee for, i guess he's with getty right um put the cap in the caption a some a supporter um you know watches the tulsa rally from the top level so he was up there by himself and you know he didn't ask the guy's name and that's kind of what we basically have to do every single time we have to you know do our reporting be good journalists and so mike brooks wrote about how he was somehow you know he's a photographer uh, i guess a documentary photographer and wrote about how he had been turned into a trump supporter um because he uh he hadn't been asked about his position there 
And, um, you know, there's this notion that, um, okay, well, he's, he's there, he's white, he's a Trump supporter, you know, what do we do? And in discussion about it, I mean, I know this is Facebook, so it's not, you can't tell somebody's sarcasm, you can't tell somebody's whatever, but um, there's, where do we start, you know, kind of like placing that line of who does and who doesn't get it, and this, this, this kind of like uh, um, protection. Um, and somebody wrote, I'm not gonna give their name, but uh, uh, on a comment about the article, um, it's on Getty Wire with his name, see the screen grab posted above. Regardless, isn't most of the back and forth about consent more about vulnerable populations, not white guys attending Trump rallies? And I worry sometimes that 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 we get into this like it, almost like there's there, there it, that this whole thing is a binary. It's yes or no. It's straight up, you know, black or white. And you know, we have to kind of maintain our our you know our um, credibility as journalists by doing the proper work. And and you know understanding that there are power structures involved with all of these protests, the Nazis, the, the uh, white supremacists, they are on the, on the far end of one spectrum. And so we can, we can pretty much say those guys are, are out. Um, but I think that there's a, there's a, a, a problem with the nuance and, you know, these, these very <laughs> non, uh, non-distinct situations, if you will. So it's a really complicated question at different places along that spectrum. And I think that it's something that we have to use our experience and our, um, our journalistic skills to really wade through that. And just a quick follow-up to that. I think that's an excellent example, Carlos. Like, it's such a clear example of why photojournalists should be speaking to the people they photograph. It's not just about consent. It is literally about doing your job. And so for that photographer to have taken an image and then it's not objective to say a supporter. You had that opinion, you assumed and you wrote it in a public, you know, you wrote it for publication. I would tell, I, that's a thing I would have failed a student for. So we really need to recognize that talking to people is best for everyone. It's best for them. It's best for us. It's best for the public. Right. And it's not a ridiculous ask. And it's, sh it's something we should be doing. Not it's talked about so much in relation to the protests right now, because of this whole thing around vulnerability, vulnerable populations, surveilled societies, et cetera. And those are all important things. But at the, the end of the day, you just need to be talking to people. And I'm seeing a lot of this, even from, you know, uh, photojournalists who've been working for 30 years. I'm seeing captions that say, a woman in line at a food bank. Did you speak to her? What, what's her name? She has a child, but do you even, is she a volunteer there? It doesn't seem like you knew. You photographed that, you made an assumption, you kept moving because you feel like you don't have to speak to people. That's a problem. Yeah, and I think um, this folds into the um, uh, just a quick little discussion on uh, what words we use in our captions. So, um, I, you know, there's maybe uh, news organizations, I hope that are thinking about, and, and photographers were the first ones who write, you know, usually who write the first captions if they don't, they end up going through copy editors later or not. Um, so, you know, using words, uh, let's say there's a peaceful protest earlier in the day and later it kind of uh, devolves into a scene of unrest and, um, you know, uh, property destruction, that kind of thing. Um, so thinking about what words are you using? How are you describing the people who are taking part in that? Are you calling, are you calling them demonstrators? And if you are, how do you know that they're demonstrators? How do you know that they're protesters? Are you talking to them? Um, how are you describing the things that they're doing? Are you calling it rioting? Um, are we thinking about the historic context of uh, using the word rioting to uh, describe, you know, especially black populations in the United States and the negative connotations with that? Um, talking about objectivity, words are still important. We're photographers, but, you know, uh, a lot of people are also bringing up the point that there are cameras everywhere, that the police, you know, have access to all sorts of stuff, social media. So, so what are we doing to raise ourselves above the person who just has their, their phone? You know, how, what is the argument that we should even be there? Are we just there to take, to add more images or are we there to, um, 
to be journalists and to uh, to think about the words that we're using when we're writing our captions. Um, so those are a few points that were discussed. Uh, we've, we, could, we could really do this for a semester. Um, so I, I think if anybody has any last closing remarks, you guys have been really generous and you've stayed way past the time that you agreed to. Um, but I will give everybody the last chance to say, say closing remarks. I would also like to thank everybody who tuned in and I'm, I'm sorry that we, we just had so many questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to every single one, but um, I hope that people, you know, enjoyed this discussion and um, I'll start, uh, let's see, we'll start with Carlos. Why don't you start with your closing? If you want to, you don't have to, you can just say I'm ready to go. Uh, well, no, I'll, I'll go after. I think Brent had something to say that, um, you know, he turned off his mic, or turned on his mic for a second on that last one. So maybe he want, has something to add. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. We're already, we're already gone beyond its time. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that one of the things we have to do as journalists is, you know, move beyond the, the guy with the phone, the guy with the, uh, you know, the little camera, the, the person who goes there, sees something, and then just writes what they see. Uh, they caption it with just what they are observing without really being thorough, without being, um, you know, engaged with, with, that person and finding really finding out why they're there. Our responsibility is to to take what we've learned as journalists and apply that, you know, across the board at these things, um, using the proper language, using um, you know skill sets of uh, reporting and observation. And I mean, we're visual we're visual people, and understanding body language is so incredibly important when it comes to how we uh, how and when we we take a photograph. Um, so yeah, as a journalist, we have a lot more responsibility because there, there's so much more um, being looked at through our photographs because we, we stand for our organizations. We have, you know, long running relationships with these communities. So it's incredibly important for us to be accurate and to, um, and to tell the story in the right way for those people in our communities. So, you know, that's, that's where I want to leave it. Thank you, Carlos. Um, um, Tara, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to start by thanking you all for having this conversation and for everyone who joined us today. And to say that ultimately, I think this issue of ethics, of visual journalism ethics, is really about being a critical thinker. It's about educating ourselves and knowing the stories that we're documenting, not just that a protest is happening, but why is that protest happening? How did we get there? And if we aren't doing that work ahead of time, I think we're missing an opportunity and we're being a bit lazy. And so I would like to kind of emphasize this importance of critical thinking and not, not giving into that laziness, right? And I also, I want to acknowledge that I think a lot of the vitriol and anger around this conversation of minimizing harm and First Amendment rights, it's coming from a space of lack of scarcity of fear because journalists are being attacked and visual journalists are constantly in danger and i absolutely respect the work of photographer conflict photographers war photographers people who are putting their lives on the line to tell these stories with their cameras that work is very important and it's not being attacked by us i think it is um, it is our duty actually to support and recognize the importance of that work to have these ethical conversations in a collegial way to recognize both the, um, the, the limitations and concerns on the ground of some of a visual journalist who might be making themselves unsafe to tell these stories to recognize that and respect it as we also inquire and consider and critically engage uh, what our responsibility is as visual journalists. Those two things don't have to be uh, in contrast or conflict. I think, again, they can be in conversation. They can be recognized at the same time. And so I, I would like to issue an entreaty to continue these conversations uh, in discussions like this and on and offline in a collegial way that acknowledges we're all just doing our best. We're all learning. We're all trying to kind of keep pace with with the rapidly changing digital environment, the rapidly changing social environment. And we just need to cut each other a little bit of slack, assume that people are trying to come from a good place and engage these conversations as, as what they are, as just 
trying to understand uh, what our role is and what we owe each other and what we owe the public. So thank you again for having us. Thank you. And Brian, you get the last word, I think. Um, no, I just want to thank everyone for, for, for coming out, for hanging out with us for an hour and a half. It's been an amazing conversation. Um, I think we are at a, a turning point. It's one of those moments where like, we have the, a lot of things in this country are being looked at and re-examined and trying to be understood about how we all got here in the first place and how, this, how do we let this go on so long? I mean, with the, the process and everything, I think a lot of people have been shaken away. They're like, whoa, what's going on? I didn't realize America was like this. I didn't realize the world was like this. So I think this is the moment we, we recalibrate and we look at everything that we've been kind of ingrained in us in such a way and re-examine the ways forward, how we can do this better, how we can grow, how we can learn, how we can bring more people to the table, how we can add more chairs. Like forever, like it's felt like the table was only been had like six chairs at it. We're like, no one else can get to the table. But like, let's, let's, let's pull another table together. Let's add those folks to the conversation that were not in the conversation beforehand. And let's see where they're coming from. Um, this is that moment that we realize in just in journalism alone, that our audience is much larger than the people that subscribe to us. That we're realizing that our journalism has waves beyond what we can even imagine. And that the power of the internet and the power of social media has opened up our photos to travel. And so we need to be more understanding and more compassionate about the way that we tell stories and how we tell them and how we go about showing people in them. Because we wanna make sure that the public could see themselves in the photos and the stories that we're telling and creating. Um, so let's use this opportunity to, to have more of those conversations. Let's use this opportunity to inform the public. Let's use this moment to honestly recalibrate how we tell stories, why we tell them and the purpose that we are telling them for. So I, 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 I hope that the people watching, the students and everyone in between are just taking this information in and let's, let's make this a more inclusive industry. Let's make this a more inclusive public service necessity that we're creating and make sure that every single person who finds themselves in our outlets or in our photographs actually sees themselves for what they are. Words matter, images matter, visuals matter. And at the end of the day, let's, this is something that we all need to have a skin in the, we have skin in the game because we all want to be reflected properly and correctly. So with that, I thank you all for coming out um, and thank you for hosting this again. This has been amazing. Awesome. So everybody, I just want to remind you that we didn't avoid people's questions on purpose. We just had so many that we couldn't get to all of them. I, we tried to hit all of the major points that we've heard discussed recently. Um, I don't know if this is possible, Kat, but there are some readings that we've collected as well. Um, kind of on some of the historic uh, stuff um, that we might be able to provide to people who could be interested along with this um, video. But um, thank you all so much. Uh, you, again, very generous with your time. You went way over um, what you all agreed to. Um, I hope that everybody um, enjoyed this discussion. Thank you so much for, you know, just providing this really, uh, this really positive space for this. Yes, thank you all for joining us. Um, we loved hearing from all the panelists. You guys are amazing, and I'm so glad you had the time to talk to us. This will be posted later today at rjionline.org. It'll be on our YouTube channel, and I've put my email in the chat box if anyone wants to email me. Um, I will also be sending out, Leah, whatever readings you guys send me, I will send to everyone who attended. So that will be available to everyone, and you know, I would love to continue the conversation another day. I think it was really interesting. And thank you again for all your time. Thank you, everyone.